<laughs> All right. Well, welcome everyone to the bio department uh, research seminar. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to have speaking for us today, Rebecca Christofferson. Uh, Dr. Vitek, would you go ahead and introduce our guest? Sure. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rebecca Christofferson. She is a faculty member at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, focusing on epidemiology of infectious diseases. Her interests and background include vector-borne diseases and ecological epidemiology of infectious diseases. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Zoology from LSU, her Master's in Applied Statistics from LSU, and her PhD from the School of Veterinary Medicine at LSU. Following that, she started at LSU as a postdoctoral researcher in 2011 and is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Pathobiological Sciences at the School of Veterinary Medicine at LSU. I guess she's really decided she likes LSU. Go Tigers. <laughs> and recently, when the COVID-19 epidemic uh, started occurring and hitting Louisiana, just like the Center for Vector-Borne Diseases here, she shifted her lab efforts and uh, abilities to provide facilities for COVID-19 testing to assist with the pandemic and detection of cases. Uh, her lab is currently testing, uh, she told me, about 800 samples a week or so. So today she's going to be talking about COVID-19 about and about the response to this pandemic. So thank you and welcome. All right. <clears throat> thank you all for having me. And uh, it's interesting, it's my first Zoom seminar, so first all around. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience with COVID. So first off, I have to tell the disclaimer that there are virologists out there that are way more qualified to talk about the ins and outs of COVID or SARS-CoV-2 than I am. So I'll keep that pretty basic. Uh, my interest, of course, was in the transmission and the spread and the global pandemic. And then I sort of got sucked into the response. And so a large part of my talk will be about the response and about how we are hoping that we set up a model here on how um, academic labs and government and um, clinical uh, entities can come together to sort of respond to if we were ever to have this ever again, which we really hope not. So um, the outline in my talk is, um, so I'll give a very brief, very superficial sort of coronavirus biology. We'll go into a slight disclaimer uh, we'll talk about the spread of the epidemic um, starting in December slash November of last year, and then we'll talk about lessons about our preparedness. So um, coronaviridae are uh, enveloped viruses, and this is why hand washing is so important, because I saw one meme, which I love memes, that says basically uh, enveloped viruses are surrounded by grease balls, and so that's why soap works so well. It just basically interrupts the grease ball, which is the envelope. They are single stranded positive sense RNA viruses, uh, and their genomes are anywhere from 27 to 32 kilobytes, uh, kilobases, um, and they encode four major structural proteins in addition to several um, non-structural proteins. The, the four major structural proteins are the membrane, the envelope, and the nucleocapsid, and of course the spike protein, which we hear a lot about. Um, coronaviruses infect humans and animals. Um, they usually call, cause respiratory illnesses or sometimes uh, GI uh, involvement. Um, there are four main genuses of coronaviruses. There's the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And the alpha and beta uh, genus of uh, coronaviruses, so alpha coronaviruses and beta coronaviruses, those are descended from the, uh, from a common ancestor that's circulated primarily in bats. Um, these both have um, human coronaviruses in them. So in the alpha, there's a coronavirus 229E, and that causes anywhere from a common cold to it can go into pneumonia if you have severe complications. There's the common uh, coronavirus NL63, which again goes into somewhat mild lower and upper respiratory infections. Um, although there can be severe complications to that and uh, proceed to pneumonia. Gamma and delta uh, coronaviruses. Gamma coronaviruses are mainly avian coronaviruses. Delta are mainly found in pigs or porcine coronaviruses. And of course, we have the beta coronaviruses, which is why we're all stuck inside all the time every day. So in the last few years, we've had several emergence uh, events of these beta coronaviruses. First was in 2000. Um, two or 2003 with the SARS, the first, the first SARS. Uh, then we have MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus, uh, Syndrome, Respiratory Syndrome, sorry. 
And then there are two common cold uh, to upper respiratory infections, infectious coronaviruses called OC43 and HKU1. Um, the major, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. Um, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus, a beta coronavirus. Uh, it comes on the heels of two major uh, human pathogens. SARS the first, as I'm calling it glibly, uh, emerged in Asia in 2003 and affected uh, over two dozen countries globally. There was a total of um, 8,400 cases. Most of them did occur in China. The case fatality rate was pretty high at 11%, and we saw the same sort of um, age stratification of uh, case fatality rates uh, that got as high as 50% in older groups. And there, there's some evidence that males were more affected than females, which we also see in MERS a bit, and we're somewhat seeing in COVID-19. So as of 2004, SARS the first has gone away. Um, there have been no recorded cases since then. Um, then there is MERS, or which was first uh, identified in Saudi Arabia in 2012. MERS is sometimes called um, the camel flu because it's thought to have jumped from a camel into the human population. There has been continuous and sporadic transmission since, um, since 2012, and there have been cases uh, recorded as recent as 2020. So there's over 2,500 cases globally. Most of the transmission is associated with Middle Eastern countries, and the case fatality rate is quite high at 34%. And again, there's some evidence to suggest that men are more at risk for adverse outcomes. Um, with these two viruses, we're not sure if that's uh, mechanistic or, or if that's just um, a social, uh, uh, like something having to do with, you know, sociology or behavior or anything like that. Okay, and now we get to COVID-19, also known as sars coronavirus 2. And we'll get into my disclaimer, which is we don't really know a whole lot about SARS-CoV-2. We keep finding out more and more every day. Um, if anyone has looked at BioArchive or MedArchive lately, you see, or even PubMed, the coronavirus literature is just exploding. So we are here, I think. Um, if we talk to the clinicians that I work with, they say we are here. So I don't know if that's frightening as it should be. Um, but we are definitely still in the exponential growth of trying to learn and get ahead of this, uh, of this virus. So the basic information is stuff that I'm sure you've all heard, um, that the person-to-person -person, uh, transmission is via droplets from coughing or sneezing, close contact with an infected individual. The social distancing paradigm right now is that you have to stay six feet apart from people in order to minimize your risk. Viability on surfaces or fomites um, is a copper surface is four hours, cardboard seems to be 24 hours, and then plastic and stainless steel, which are the, the ones you usually have to worry about, um, are up to 72 hours. There is new evidence that shows that the aerosol or the droplets that live in the air might actually persist not three hours, but six. Um, but again, we're still learning, and I think there's a lot of um, a lot of work to be done before we get to any definitive answers. So the incubation period is one to 14 days, which just means we don't know because that's very wide. The average onset of fever is five to 0.7 days or a median of like uh, about five. 97.5 um, of infected individuals display fever by 12.5 days. Now that's kind of a trick statement because that's 97.5% of infected infected individuals that we can identify. And so uh, I'll talk in a minute about um, silent transmission, but as I'm sure you're all aware, we probably have not identified most of the COVID-19 cases. Um, the contagious period, um, this, this is thought to last uh, anywhere, again, up to two weeks, but you can be contagious before you short start showing symptoms. Some people will never show symptoms and they are contagious. We call those asymptomatic cases. And those are people who are transmitting even though they don't feel sick. And then you have what's called subclinical. Subclinical means that you think you have a cold or you have hay fever or you have something that you just feel a little off, but you feel otherwise fine. So it's not that you have zero symptoms, you just don't have enough symptoms that somebody's going to suspect that you have something severe. So subclinical people are probably also shedding virus and are contagious. 
um, during before and during their mild symptoms. So um, the general symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath, and tiredness. Now we're also hearing that bone aches and just general malaise and achiness is a, is a common symptom that we're hearing about now. Occasionally you have people who say that they have sore throats, aches and pains, nasal congestion, and diarrhea. Diarrhea has actually become, I put that more in general than occasional now. Um, the other thing is this sense of this um, anecdote of loss of smell and then loss of taste. Loss of smell being the more common uh, complaint in people who have uh, been infected. So this, this slide I purposely left as is, but when we first started talking about COVID-19, um, we had this idea that the elderly, especially when we looked at the data coming out of Italy, coming out of China, the elderly, especially those 70 years of age or, or greater, were accounting for the majority of hospitalizations and deaths. And so at that point we figured, well, there's some sort, there's something going on with the elderly population that makes them more at risk for adverse outcomes, such as needing a ventilator, um, needing hospitalization, having decreased lung infection, uh, lung function even upon discharge, or of course death. Of course, anyone who's immunocompromised, so those who have autoimmune diseases or on chemotherapy, for example, they are at higher risk. And then we, of course, uh, have heard about serious chronic medical conditions or comorbidities such as hypertension, lung disease or lung function issues such as asthma, and then diabetes. These are all things that have affected the risk of um, a severe outcome or progression to severe disease from, from infection. Um, preventative measures, I would be remiss if I just didn't bang you on the head with this once again, but regular hand washing. If you don't have access to regular hand washing like with soap and warm water, then alcohol-based sanitizers will, uh, will kill it. We're, we're, um, re we're recommending 60% alcohol or above. Um, I found some 70% isopropanol in the store the other day and about, it was like, I think I put some in Easter baskets or something. So I was really excited about that. Um, you, you avoid touching your face and that's because your hand, uh, you avoid touching your eyes and your mouth because those are, those are points of entry for the virus. So your mucosa, your mouth, these are places where the virus can get in and then cause an infection. So if you touch something like one of those plastic surfaces where the virus is living and then introduce it into your face area, you could have caught it from whatever you touched. Um, preventative measures from you giving it to somebody else is cover your coughs and sneezes. Um, so we have, of course, stay home if you feel unwell was the recommendation for a while. And of course, social distancing, which we all are very familiar with. Eventually the stay at home if you feel well came, became just stay at home. So the stay at home order that Louisiana has, has been, I think, uh, I think it's in multiple states now. Um, and we have shown that that has really helped uh, avoid a chaotic situation where healthcare systems get um, overwhelmed. And I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. So one of the other questions I get uh, quite often is, why is this different from the flu? And it's different from the flu because seasonal flu vaccines um, mean that not everyone is susceptible. So there are roadblocks to the flu infecting everyone because not everyone is susceptible. Even if you have a faulty or leaky flu vaccine, it's going to work a lot of the time. And then if you get the flu, even if you're vaccinated, um, it's often a mild attenuated version of the illness, which means your infectious period is likely also shortened. So SARS-CoV-2 is a brand new uh, virus and the entire world is, is, is susceptible. So the analogy I use is you have a bunch of dry wood and you've put a bunch of gasoline on it and you have a match, boom. And it just, it can burn everything. So there's no immune compression. The other thing with uh, the flu is that the disease presentation is usually relatively uniform across all age groups. And that doesn't mean that the severity of disease presentation is uniform but we can generally see the flu in all like you see the flu in children you see the flu in teenagers you see the flu in adults you see the flu in, in the elderly with SARS-CoV-2 it disproportionately presents symptomatically in older populations and so we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg and so this is where the idea of cryptic or hidden transmission comes from 
when you can't see where the transmission is coming from, it makes it that much harder to stop transmission or to put a roadblock there. And so that's the two main reasons why, um, in my opinion, this is, this is different from the flu, um, just from an, a transmission standpoint. So we talked a little bit about the biology of coronavirus, a very little bit, um, but you hear a lot in the news about the spike protein. So what's the deal with the spike protein? So the spike protein on the surface of the coronavirus is what gives it its name coronavirus. So corona means crown, hence the little graphic, and it's because you have all these little protrusions that look like a, a crown sitting on a, you know, a sphere. This is a major cell receptor binding factor. So it aids entry into the cell. So the spike protein is what helps the virus get into the cell. And that's what's going to promote replication intracellularly and then, you know, come into a fulminant infection. It's thought to bind through the ACE2 inhibitors. Um, and I think that's, that's accurate. But when we're looking at disease presentation, it's a little strange because um, generally in the elderly population, uh, it's my understanding from the physicians we're working with that the ACE2 is downregulated in older populations. The other thing is, is that hypertensive individuals are often on ACE2 inhibitors. And so unless we're having a huge hypertension uh, medication compliance issues, I think there's probably a little more to what the spike protein is doing other than just ACE2, and, uh, ACE2 binding. That being said, the spike protein is the target of a lot of vaccine efforts because if you neutralize the spike protein, you can neutralize its entry into the cell and then you can block, uh, block its becoming a, a big infection. So this is from a paper um, that just shows, you can see the, the coronavirus with the spikes, um, they look like little tulips here protruding from the, um, from the surface of the, the virus. And this is the ACE2 uh, <clears throat> cellular receptor binding, and then this, this purple thing over here that uh, sort of helps, that activates the ACE2 uh, SARS coronavirus complex and, and helps it get into the cell. So um, I put this paper here because it's actually really good and understandable. And if you want to go read it, I highly recommend it. So. We, um, people who study transmission and emerging viruses kind of were following this since December because, you know, interesting new virus, don't know what it is. And when it started getting out of China and we started seeing more and more severe disease and transmission seemed to be quite intense, we started worrying about a few things. One was transmission, okay? So it was sort of inev inevitable that it would get out of China. Where was it gonna go? What was it gonna do? One was testing, and the other was healthcare system stress. So these are going to be the three major um, kind of topics that I talk about for the, the for the remainder. So this is the timeline of, of SARS. Uh, in December of uh, 19, 2019, that should be 2019, um, the WHO informed uh, was informed of a cluster of pneumonia of unknown origin in Wuhan, China. So while it's said to have started in December, retroactively they believe that actually there was transmission of SARS-CoV-2 uh, as early as November in China. In January you had uh, the novel coronavirus was isolated and so you were able to identify SARS-CoV-2 as the causative agent of that cluster of, uh, of pneumonia. In January uh, 22nd was the first reported case in the U.S. in Washington state we now know that that was probably um, late and that there was probably uh, silent transmission before then. In January 24th, the, the first European case was reported in France. Um, it was still kind of a quiet story at this point because I was actually in France in February and we were talking about COVID-19, but I was also working with a bunch of infectious disease modelers, so we tend to talk about that stuff anyway. But people on the street weren't talking about it. The news wasn't talking about it, um, wasn't talking about that much. So it wasn't until about February, or the end of February, the beginning of March, when it really started to get out of control in, um, in Italy and in South Korea and in other parts that it really became a huge 24-hour news cycle thing. Um, in March 2nd, we had the first death was reported in the United States. 
in March 9th was the first presumptive case in the state of Louisiana. That's the first one that was reported. March 11th uh, was when the WHO declared the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> and then March 14th was the first death in Louisiana in New Orleans from, from COVID-19. So even though we reported the first presumptive case March 9th, 2020, something happened in February of that year, which is Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And there's been a lot of anecdotal stories of people who have gotten sick a week or two weeks after visiting uh, New Orleans for Mardi Gras. Some of those started chains of transmission in other cities or in other states. Um, the CDC recently came out and sort of traced some, um, some transmission back to Mardi Gras. So if you've never been to Mardi Gras, it's about the worst thing you can imagine if you're trying to stop an epidemic. People are crowded like this. Everybody's touching everybody. Everybody's, there's coughing and sneezing and spitting going on. It's just, it's the worst case scenario. Um, so at this point, we knew we had something, right? March 14th was when New Orleans was really starting to, to bump up and ramp up into that logarithmic growth of, a, of an epidemic. And at that point, we were all talking about testing, testing, testing. We need to do community testing. We need to know what what's going on. We need to know who's infected. We need to know like what is the actual intensity of transmission that we can't see because we know there's hidden transmission. So we were modeling our, our sort of expectations or our, our wants after uh, South Korea. So South Korea, as you may know, tested, did a lot of community testing after they discovered uh, a cluster of, of COVID cases. And so you can see they, they recognized or they, they had the ability to test before they started having these spikes here. And that was because in mid-January, the uh, health authorities in South Korea partnered with uh, pharmaceutical com companies and research institutions to develop a test. And so they gained the ability to test relatively early in the epidemic and were able to, to sort of spread that out and test the community at large. And what that did was it found not only sick people, but it found people who weren't sick, but who could be then stopped. And, you know, you're not sick, but you're infectious. So don't go out and infect other people. And that was kind of the model for the world about if we test, 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 then maybe we can get ahead of this curve. But that didn't happen. Um, some of the first CDC tests were available in February, I think in Manhattan. Um, and they weren't great. They're still not great, but they are what we have. Um, Louisiana started testing in early March. And so when, when we found our first presumptive case, we started testing. Now, part of that was that um, the test kits were not available. There was uh, the volume of kits available was not to demand, I suppose. And the WHO, uh, not the WHO, the CDC test is actually, um, was validated on symptomatic individuals. It was not validated at that time on asymptomatic. I'm not sure it is yet which means that the validity of the test and the reliability of the results were based on people who were symptomatic. And that included people who were febrile, who had a cough or respiratory distress, uh, and who met a certain algorithm of symptoms. And so the community testing, um, I think was in part held off just because of the logistics of what the test was created for, which was symptomatic people. Around that time, we also started looking at models, right? So I'm sure everybody is familiar with, um, well, I'm sure some of you at least are familiar with the Imperial model coming out of the Imperial College of London that the UK adopted somewhat erroneously, um, or not erroneously, mis misadopted or misinterpreted. Um, they, at first, the UK was just going to let herd health take care of it, and then people realized that lots and lots of people were going to die, and they decided to backtrack on that. But what they did show is, as out of Wuhan, they showed this age stratification. You can see here the case fatality ratio. Um, as you get older and older, you see climbs exponentially. And once you get into the 70 to 79 or 80 plus range, your case fatality ratio is just is quite significantly higher. Higher. 
in that in this um, in this work, which uh, I can put a link to, I meant to and forgot. Sorry, is that um, they also looked at the stress on healthcare. So one of the things that in, in infectious disease modeling you have to remember is that it's not just who's going to die of this disease, but if the healthcare system falls apart, then who's going to die of a heart attack because there were no ICU beds, or who's going to die of COPD because all the ventilators were used for COVID patients. And so healthcare stress is a, is a sort of um, more broad way of assessing the, um, um, the impacts of a pandemic in a population. And so that was a big, uh, that was a big part of this modeling was how much stress will and can the, uh, the, the, the UK uh, national healthcare system take. But we've sort of adopted that idea here as well as we were trying to look at how much stress can our healthcare systems take and, and what can we do to mitigate that. So early on in the, um, in the epidemic, we started looking at hypertension and diabetes as risk factors and comorbidities. This was coming out of Wuhan, it was coming out of Italy. And I started to think about it, and I put this here um, with the date, oops, go back. Um, not really to, to kind of show off, but also just to show that we were thinking about this. Louisiana is fourth in the nation for hypertension. Um, we eat very well, but it does not do much for our health. Um, we have a high level of diabetes, and these often go along uh, a poverty gradient. And right now we're seeing that African Americans are um, more likely to have high rates of diabetes and the severe complications from COVID. Um, and so we started to think about here with my, my co-investigators my co uh, in this crazy idea of COVID, was that our risk group for severe disease might be broader than 70 years old and older. So at this point, do we have to start thinking about um, having more stress on the hospital because more people are at risk for, to need hospitalization? So we thought, well, if a, if a higher proportion of cases is likely to present a severe disease, you will have more hospitalization. That leads to an increased risk of healthcare system stress and potential failure. There was a potential pro to that, though, is that is this an indication of increased visibility of transmission? So we have less silent transmission because more people are getting sick. Obviously, that is a terrible pro, but it was, it was an idea. Or is this just representative of an overall proportional increase in transmission intensity? So those are the two options that we had. Neither one of them are great. And so the issue was that the model of hospital uses and transmission was largely informed by the data coming out of Wuhan. And so at that point, with the knowledge that we might have this broader at-risk population, we were still flying in the dark. And we just basically, we had models, they were informing us, but were they really based in data that was going to represent what's going on here in Louisiana? So now what, right? So in the absence of the community testing, because it was, it was too late to do that, cases had already started to come. We were going into the bin for the exponential curve on, in Baton Rouge as well. And with the focus of shift going from just finding out where transmission is to keeping the hospitals viable and getting them um, to where they're not so stressed that they collapse or that we just start having people not have the appropriate healthcare availability, we got to the now what? Right, And so that's when we started to sort of uh, visit the idea of how could an academic lab like ours be retooled and repurposed to respond. So there were several issues um, that contributed to healthcare collapse. One was the turnaround test for times, uh, the yeah, turnaround time for tests, excuse me. Um, one was ICU beds, which was um, sort of an issue of turnaround time. Uh, the other is per Personnel, so workforce, uh, workforce issues uh, in that you need no more ICU nurses than usual, so you're trying to repurpose nurses from other departments. You have in exposure and infection control. You can have reticence to, to work the COVID unit. Um, and then you have to sort of account for, um, the, you know, possible exposure of your, in, of community exposure of your workforce as well, because when 
when you work in a controlled environment, which an ICU, believe it or not, is relatively controlled, according to my ICU doc here, or you work in a lab, you have control over who's around you, what PPE you have on, what's going, it's like a well choreographed dance. But if you go to the grocery store, you know, you're, I, I think you're more at risk at the grocery store for community transmission. So you had to account for a community exposure and community infection of your personnel as well. And then of course, as we've seen across the country, there was this idea of PPE depletion, which sort of goes all the way up to turnaround tests, personnel are not gonna be happy about having no PPE and that's gonna increase their reticence uh, or their, or even their ability to appropriately treat um, COVID patients. So the turnaround test, time for tests, um, the state lab has a capacity of, or had a capacity, it's, it's, it's gone up since, of about 200 tests per day. Um, and this was because the CDC assay required, uh, at the time when they first started, required actually four gene targets, three COVID gene tar targets, and then a human RNA DNA control called RP. And what that is, is a, um, it is a control for basically, is it a good swab? So if they stick it in your nose and they rummage around and they tickle your brain, you're gonna have a really good RP response and you know that that's a good spot, a, a good swab. So if you're negative or not detected at that point, it's not because the effort of swabbing you is bad. If your RP is off and you have a negative RP, then that's called an invalid test because you can't say that there's no virus there because there's no person there either, right? So the swab was not where it needed to be or it was too gentle or whatever. So at the time, that really greatly diminished the capability of, of, of high throughput because you had to do four different tests for each person. And at the time, there was no multiplex. So you had to run each PCR reaction separately for each of the four targets. Since then, the CDC has dropped one of the gene targets. And so you're down to uh, three. And actually right now, the FDA is considering dropping down to one gene target. I don't know if that's approved yet. That was as of early this week that they were considering it. Uh, one COVID gene target. You still need the RP to, to validate the, the swabbing effort. Um, so the turnaround time from the state lab was approximately five to seven business days. Now it fluctuated. You'd get it as soon as three or as late as 10, but the average was about five to seven days. And I think it still is. For commercial labs, excuse me, the turnaround time was three to seven business days. Um, the fluctuations were anywhere from three to 14 business days. They were able to more scale up for commercial through, uh, through high throughput, but it's a pay for service. And so it's sort of first come first serve. Whereas with the state lab, you have some ability to call and say, we need to prioritize ventilated patients or people who need whatever. Um, commercial tests, you have less flexibility in them or com commercial enterprises. So we are none of these. Um, and we'll uh, talk about what that means uh, as I get closer to what, what we actually did. Um, so I see you bed use, why that is a resource that was um, limited was they had to take regular ICU rooms and turn them into negative pressure rooms. And these, this, this needed to be done basically during the upscale of an epidemic. And so that was disruptive to um, availability of ICU beds in general. And then they had the development of COVID units at most of the big hospitals. And that, um, that means that you have a finite uh, group of people who can do all of the COVID related stuff. And at that point, you also have sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, like, a, like we had sort of like infighting factions, right? The COVID unit versus the not COVID unit. And that sort of goes into the next thing, which is personnel. So the personnel issue is a matter of, um, there is some reticence to work on COVID patients. Uh, they've made, that I think primarily goes back to the fact that they lack appropriate PPE and that a lot of, um, a lot of first responders feel that they've sort of been hung out to dry, not necessarily at the hospitals I'm working with because they're, doing a pretty good job. But in a lot of parts of the country, I know first responders are feeling um, kind of thrown to the wolves, especially with this uh, N95 mask uh, unavailability. 
and um, the PPE that's necessary. N95 masks, they're recommending uh, surgical masks if you don't have any N95. There was a recent publication that came out recently about how to decon N95s, including uh, I think the use of UV light, appropriate gowns and face protection. So some people are using face shields that go cover the chin, because if you're doing, if you're intubating, it's my understanding that sometimes this is the exposure uh, route. Um, those were in short order. And it, it affects, this affects overall your personnel willingness as well as your overall morale. And, and morale is, even in my little group here, morale is a, huge, is a huge deal. If you have high morale, then you're just, things get done easier and better. This of course also goes into increase with the risk of transmission in the healthcare, because if you're not appropriately protected, then your risk does go up. And if you have an increased risk, then you're gonna interrupt your workforce because even losing one nurse could have profound effects or one respiratory therapist. Um, so it's all interconnected into why, um, why we needed operational support from, from my lab and my, my partner, uh, Stefania Cormier's lab. So with that, I'm gonna tell you about our roadmap to operational support. So. Our RTL stands for River Road Testing Lab at LSU. And so our, we, we chose that for a couple of reasons. One, the president of the university was a little reticent to put LSU on the application of a, a CLIA, which I don't even know what CLIA stands for, but a CLIA application, which gave us basically temporary designation as a human clinical diagnostic lab. And two, it was literally 1130 at night, and that's all we could come up with. So the LSU vet school sits literally on a road called River Road, and we were doing testing. And we were just uncreative at that point. So River Road Testing Labs at LSU. Um, so if we go back to the timeline, early March, we start testing, the state starts testing. People are sending tests to Mayo Clinic or to um, Quest or LabCorp. I had just returned 14 days prior from France, and I had, I knew this was, coming basically because I had been watching it. I didn't really think that New Orleans and Louisiana would be quite so ahead of the ball or ahead of the curve here, but I knew it was going to come eventually. So on March 13th, we started stockpiling tests, we started stockpiling kits, and we started stockpiling reagents. Um, and by that we mean we started ordering. So we spent a lot of money in a little bit of time. That was March um, 13th-ish. Time has become somewhat fluid in my mind these days, but um, so we start. So this is a timeline of what <laughs> of what we did. Um, <clears throat> we started our CLIA application process somewhere around the 17th. The 18th, we received BSL-3 committee biosafety approval. We chose to do this at the BSL-3 level for a couple reasons. One, I'm I am one of the major PIs in the BSL-3. I am perfectly comfortable in a BSL-3, and I thought it will alleviate some of the associated fear that I thought would come with putting COVID patient samples into the vet school. Um, and since I'm comfortable in the BSL-3, it didn't, it didn't bother me. Uh, on March 20th, received our, our biosafety approval from the institution. Somewhere between the 20th and the 23rd, we got our HIPAA training so that we were all legal and ready to go. And then on the 23rd, we got CLIA certification at 3 p.m. and we ran our first batch of tests that night at six. So as of April 14th, 15th, we tested our 2000th sample. And so we've been rocking and rolling pretty hard um, since then. We partnered with a clinical lab director from Women's Hospital, which is a hospital um, not far from here that's primarily sees, uh, it's, a, it's a women's hospital, it's primarily sees women for um, surgery and it's the primary birth center for the, for the region. Um, their clinical medical director was gracious enough to come and explain all the CLIA stuff tests because we didn't understand any of it. There was, and it seemed very redundant to us there was multiple steps to validation. You have to validate every person doing PCR, every machine that you're gonna run. It just, it was, we had, they wanted to know what our qualifications were to run PCR, and we didn't even know how to explain that because we were like, we just do it all the time. Um, there was just a lot of red tape, and without them, 
I don't know what we would have done. So <clears throat> we were able to get an EUA application. So that's an emergency youth use authorization to the FDA to scale up to a 384 well platform. And what this means is that we can do 94 to 95 individual patients in a day. Sometimes we do twice that much if we're feeling frisky um, because we can test for all three gene targets and a single PCR run. Um, this means that our turnaround time has been reduced to 12 to 24 hours upon receipt of samples. And the reason that's important is because um, and it, it's an interesting um, sort of departure from what I'm used to in research, is that in research, usually the positives are the interesting bit because it's data. It's like everybody wants a positive, you know, negative results are less exciting. When you think about operational support, the not detected or negative patients are the important ones because patients who have the virus are going to remain in the COVID unit. They're not going to get moved out of the COVID unit. But the patients without detected SARS-CoV with clinical indication, and I'll explain that in a minute, can be moved out of the COVID unit and then you free it up. And so these are the people, these are the, these are the swaths of people that actually maintain the healthcare system viability is your ability to move them out of the way. Now, just because our test says that they don't have COVID RNA in that sample does not mean that these people don't have SARS-CoV-2. And we have, we have, we don't use the words negative, we use the words not detected because we have some patients, and there was a paper out of, it was either New England Journal of Medicine or um, Nature, where some patients, they, here's the limited detection, they do this. And so they're negative one day and they're positive one day, and they're negative one day and they're positive another day. And it's because the limited, the test is not infallible. So we still need clinicians and we still need the doctors to sort of make a best educated guess and inform them if we can, but there are some people who don't have uh, detectable RNA, but the, the, the physicians are like, I still think they have it. Conversely, there was one woman who they were like, I don't think she's got it. And she was definitely positive. And so these are sort of the, the kind of um, interesting clinical research partners or pairings that, um, that have become an, an interesting observation for me, who's not used to working um, with current clinical samples. Usually all my current clinical samples are from, from uh, leftover from other tests. Um, so River Road Testing Labs, we began testing on March 23rd. We are focused, we were originally focused primarily on hospital admissions and critical care patients. This has evolved somewhat. We are still focused primarily on ICU and critical care patients because those are the ones that need the, the uh, turnaround time to be greatly shortened. But we have also done some uh, nursing home uh, patients, and we've also done a little bit of um, like outpatient uh, and well baby. Uh, so if, a, if an infant has a mom who's, who's positive or a family member who's positive, we will test outpatient uh, infants. Luckily, those are mostly negative. As of April 14th, um, we had tested eight, uh, 1,843 patients. We have a pretty consistent positivity rate that seems to, to hang around 38 to 40 percent. One day we were really excited it got down to 23 percent and then we realized we tested a bunch of outpatients. One day we were really freaked out because we, we had 53 percent and it was just, there's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of nursing home patients. But it's the 54.8 percent of not detected, again, that is the operational support. Those are the ones that are actionable and that can be moved out of the way. The median turnaround time from collection is about 1.5 days, and that is from the time that they're swabbed. So we usually get the swab about 12, hour later, 12 hours later, which means our median turnaround time is a little under 24 hours uh, from, from the time that we receive the sample. Um, this is an interesting... Um, so the, the ID doc in charge of the big hospital system here said so that for every patient in isolation, the daily use of PP is approximately 23 gowns, 23 pairs of gloves, and 23 masks. So for every patient that you're able to move from the COVID unit, you save this much PPE daily. And so the other benefits are you have that PPE available for 
for other for other patients and for other nurses or for other technicians. But the other benefits is is the risk of nosocomial transmission decreases, right? So if you're in the COVID unit and you don't need to be in the COVID unit, you want to get the hell out of the COVID unit. So you can you can mitigate that risk. And then the other benefit is they're more likely to look at a differential diagnosis other than COVID if you can rule out COVID. So we've seen a lot of people who say, well, they've got, um, I don't know, we have one who had pneumonia and they're like, we're sure it's COVID. And, and <clears throat> we tested this person over and over and we're, it's not COVID. And so finally, I don't know, their test came back from one of the lab cores and she had just plain old fashioned pneumonia. And so I think that, no one has ever been so happy to have plain old-fashioned pneumonia than that one person. Um, so this is our current standings as of uh, yesterday. Unfortunately, our number of deaths has gone up by 53 today. So we have over 1,200 deaths in Louisiana. We've got over 22,000 reported cases as of today. Um, the use of ventilators has been on a downward trend in Orleans and Jefferson parishes. Here in East Baton Rouge, it's been pretty stable. Across the world, there have been 2 million cases and there were 120,000 deaths. I think that's low. I think I read somewhere that we're at almost 200,000 deaths now. So, um, yeah, so that's where we are with uh, the world rod view, and that's why we're all still stuck at, stuck at home. So working with physicians has been interesting, <coughs> excuse me, because I don't, I don't work with physicians uh, terribly often, but there have been some interesting clinical observations that um, for me as a researcher doing testing in real time have been interesting to sort of hear about as well. So we're working with a pulmonologist and an ICU critical care doctor who basically says <clears throat> this is viral sepsis. So sepsis is organ failure just because your immune response is just gone crazy. So some of the terms you'll hear people use are DIC, or cytokine storm. These are both instances where you're just, your immune system's like, I'm gonna throw everything I can at it and the kitchen sink. And at that point, you go into organ failure and sepsis because your body's just sort of, it's too much for your body to, to take. So a lot of critical care research, research over the last 24 years has been focused on sepsis, but most of the sepsis that you see in critical care is bacterial. And so usually, there are several therapeutic options. Antibiotics, source control, which is where if you have an abscess, you drain the abscess, or if you have a, a dying gallbladder, you take the gallbladder out, and then, uh, and then followed by supportive care. But with viruses, um, there's no specific treatment, okay? You can't give antibiotics, you can't treat a viral infection with antibiotics. And so it's all about supportive care, which means you just got to support the patient's body as much as possible so that it can right itself, basically. And because there's no specific therapy, patients often spiral out of control. For what we've seen is that can happen very quickly in COVID-19. In a matter of hours to days, they can go from being probably okay to just crashing. Um, there's no evidence that, that you can use bacterial um, you know, you can apply what you know from bacterial sepsis to what you do in viral sepsis. Um, you don't have reason to believe otherwise, except that you don't have the, the treatment regimen available of antibiotics. But right now, you're just building up anecdotal evidence and observations, because as he explained to me is, you see viral sepsis, but you might see it once in a blue moon. Now, all of a sudden, you're seeing six, seven cases a day, and we just don't know what to do with it. And so we're still learning that's probably why in, in the, we are here in the clinical kind of move this way a little bit, is we're still learning what to do with, uh, with viral sepsis. So did we learn anything or what are we learning globally? Well, I think we're all learning that we were globally and especially in the United States, unprepared, woefully unprepared. Um, I've been aggravated beyond, you know, I, I just, I can't believe we were this, unprepared. We've spent money on preparedness after Ebola. After Zika and after Ebola, I sat on two Louisiana ghost of meetings, which is our preparedness. Um, this is not a bioterrorism. I don't think this was made in a lab, but I know that uh, DOD and Homeland Security has spent um, 
time and money on bioterrorism preparedness. And my question to them is, what did they think it would look like, right? So this is kind of a this is kind of what it would have looked like. Um, but again, I don't think this is a bioterrorism thing. I don't think it was created in Wuhan in the lab. Uh, so let's just get that out the way. So we were unprepared, but at the same time, there were obstacles. There was a lot of red tape. Some of it was unnecessary. Some of it was just territorial. People didn't want people like me coming and saying, hey, I can do this because either they didn't think I could do it or they just didn't want to deal with the fact that they had what they viewed as competition. I didn't want to compete with anybody. <clears throat> there was a lot of red tape red tape that was redundant so if i had to do something with the fda then i had to go do it with the state then i had to do it with the hospital or whatever and then the rules seemed to change from day to day so one day we needed to do a validation that looked like this and then the next day we needed to tweak it a little bit and do it look like this so there was some, there was just a lot of frustration on our part about what just tell tell me what to do i will follow directions but nobody could ever tell me what the protocol was, right? And so as a, as a researcher and a scientist, I'm used to like, give me the recipe, give me the protocol, I can follow directions. So a lot of the obstacles were, were just regulatory, just chaos. Um, eventually it became Thunderdome and there was no more rules. Uh, the FDA has kind of gone to like, Meh. you uh, apply to them for a emergency use authorization and they come back as long as you can show that you are um, validated and justified and that you are capable. So <clears throat> I will say that not all the regulations and all the red tape is unnecessary because you do want somebody capable and somebody competent doing the testing. And there are a lot of labs out there who I'm sure would like to say, oh, I can do it, who maybe shouldn't. So it's sort of a double-edged sword. Um, the lessons learned by us as academicians was that um, we can apply our skills learned and utilized daily. So I do, do, we do PCR every day and we do it in high throughput every day. We do, I mean, Dr. Vita can tell you when you work with mosquitoes, you process hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of samples for like one part of an experiment. So we know how to do high throughput. Um, we didn't realize how important that skill was to operational support in, an, in, a, in a pandemic. I, I didn't at least. Uh, it makes sense to me now looking back, of course it does, but that was something learned. Um, regulatory entities were unaware of what we could offer. So we got this statement, was, which was, we weren't sure that research labs are used to the volume of testing that might occur. And they didn't understand that we could do high throughput or that we do high throughput on a regular basis. Um, so it became a lesson to us about how do we better communicate our capabilities and our willingness to respond. Um, that is something I think that we are, we are in a place to sort of help other entities realize. Um, lessons learned by the community. Um, I think there's a, an idea that Biomedical research or research labs or academic labs in general are siloed and that we work on these high level theoretical questions and that to get us to come back down to earth requires, you know, lead strings or lead shoes. Maybe that's true because there have certainly been a fair amount of times I've reached out to other academics to provide operational support and they're more interested in getting the next paper out. So there are people who are like that and I'm not saying that they are wrong um it's just two different viewpoints um but there are uh, at least a group of us who are willing and ready to retool um our labs especially biological and biomedical labs to support and scale for pandemic response this is an unprecedented situation right i don't think anybody expect as sure as hell didn't expect louisiana to be <laughs> number one in the world for uh per capita cases a couple of weeks ago but um but it's it's been interesting to sort of apply a relatively mundane part of my job to to a, a very important question and um and i think there are a lot of people out there who would like to do it uh this was in the the naturalist or the american nature i can't remember but thousands of coronavirus tests are going unused in u.s labs so there are people who 
are out there with academic labs who can do this, who are running into the same red tape that we ran into, who are having the same supply chain issues that we ran into. Uh, we were lucky in that we were kind of ahead of the curve, but you know there are plenty of others who got stuck in the, uh, the bottleneck that is supply chain. And finally, we're hoping that, you know, River Road Testing Labs at LSU can, can provide a model for how administrators at hospitals, academia, um, administrators at LSU, um, the president and the provost office have been amazing, how the government, uh, the state of Louisiana, and uh, our government officials in Washington have come on board and helped us, uh, and the clinical, the doctors and the uh, nurses and the hospital administrators, how we can all work together to sort of to provide this critical response. We were supposed to have stopped testing this week. Um, we've been doing it for about a month or a little over three weeks, but the um, hospitals have had the same supply chain issues that we have had, and so they've asked us to continue. I don't know how long. We'll see. We have to we have to work out the details. But the state lab has also told us that they can't pick up our, they will not be able to provide the same turnaround and volume of testing if we were to quit. So we are providing an important service to the hospitals in that we can turn around those negatives. And that's, that's been very, very gratifying. Um, this is me sleeping under a desk and my student threatens that when I decide to save the world again, she's gonna show me this picture because <laughs> I think I was pretty miserable at this point. Um, this is a team comprised of myself, um, my, uh, co my colleague, Dr. Stefania Cormier, her postdoc in research tech, my graduate students, and uh, a handful of physicians from our Lady of the Lake and Baton Rouge General here in, in Baton Rouge. And so with that, I thank you for the opportunity and I hope you enjoyed the talk and I will take any questions you might have. All right, thank you. Please everyone join me in virtually thanking uh, Dr. Christofferson for her um, time. Um, I'm asked people to go ahead and post questions. You can, can you read them on the chat or would you like me to, to convey them to you? Uh, can you tell me how to get to the chat? Sure, at the bottom you might see a little button that says chat. Um, I can also convey it to you. So the first question from Chris Vitek, do you anticipate keeping the CLIA certification and assisting with other diseases or was this a one-time thing? Um, no, so we do not. This was a one-time thing for our lab. Um, there has been interest in from the LSU higher-ups that we um, retain the ability to do this uh, in the future if another pandemic were to occur. But as far as um, keeping up the clinical diagnostics after this pandemic, no, because I still have students who want to graduate <laughs> And I and actually, I mean, you know. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so I was wondering in, I was wondering about the support for your lab in this. Uh, is it uh, contracts, short-term contracts, extensions of previous work? It's a lot of time mm -hmm. and materials. Right. So uh, originally we, I had, um, so we get like fun money back to the lab. Um, and I kind of went through that. But when we started testing in earnest, the hospital stepped up and have, paid us back for much of what we did. And then we have the Baton Rouge Area Foundation has contributed as well, um, some support for us to continue because at some point we did run out of available funds. And so, and then actually we had a lot of support from the public. So when the press got a hold of it, we, we tried to hold off the press because you'd be amazed at, at we didn't want a bunch of people showing up at the vet school with Q-tips in a Ziploc bag, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had some experiences from the Zika outbreak that I didn't, I didn't want to repeat. So, when the, but the press got a hold of it and they did a story. And at that point, we actually had people um, want to help crowdsource. So we have a crowdsourcing um, account that's been set up that we've, that we've got a little bit um, that, yeah, we've used to, to support the efforts. Okay, we have a question um, talking about the red tape. Can you expand on the line between prudence and efficiency with laboratory testing? So I can tell you my opinion, right? So my opinion is that there's too much red tape. However, that's because I'm aware that I am probably a competent person. If I was looking at someone who opened up a lab two weeks ago and has never held a pipette, 
I would want that person to go through a lot of red tape. And so I think it was just, it's situational. It was frustrating for me. I understand how, I understand that it's important. Um, I wish there was a better way of vetting people so that you could sort of move past this, like, are you sane kind of first question? Although I guess in academia, that's, that's a necessary question. So maybe not that one, but um, yeah. So it's, 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 again, it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on the you know testing side here locally, one of the local uh, civic leaders spent hundreds of thousands of, of uh, their local dollars to buy a bunch of tests from China that turned out to be you know trash from an unregulated lab. Well, so, when we start talking about vaccines too, because that'll come online soon, is I, I I'm not a huge fan of fast tracking vaccines. Um, to me, that that has not worked well with either the dengue or even the Ebola vaccine. I mean, I guess some efficacy is better than none, but, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a, Chris agrees with you strongly. And we have a question from Jorge. Is there a publication that might come out of all the work you've done in interest of creating a model for repurposing labs during a pandemic, which is yeah. um, undoubtedly will reoccur? Yes. So we're working on that right now. So actually it, it sort of worked out. This is going to be part of my, one of my students' uh, master's thesis, uh, because she's, her strength is managing parts of things right and so this was um and there was a lot of parts to manage uh we've we've fallen into a well choreographed dance now where because i, I forgot to mention we are seven people <laughs> so there's two people on campus who are allowed to hold the virus that's me and my senior graduate student and then uh, my my master's level student has um she's uh, she's more of the the logistics she and the research associate are the the logistics handler. And then I have this poor kid who joined my lab literally a week before we started this. Uh, so he might have some regrets, but he's he's been awesome. He's the grunt. We need somebody to take out the trash. We need somebody to, like, I had to get him to go put gas in my car today because I was literally on empty. So, but he's doing wonderfully. Um, so, and then we have a PCR crew. So we sort of channeled everybody into the little spots um, we are writing this up as a, as a paper. Uh, some of the data that you saw here is a, little, is a little old, and we have other hospitals that are going to provide us data with about uh, the, the financial impact as well as the people impact. So yeah, we're hoping to get that out in the next month, maybe. Okay. We have a couple questions about uh, the virus. So do you have a personal estimate, uh, your opinion, as to how high the numbers will spike before they decline? No, and I'll tell you why because that depends on other people. Um, so we were doing really well in Louisiana and then Good Friday hit. And Good Friday in Louisiana is typically a huge holiday because everybody wants to boil crawfish. And then over Easter weekend, um, we had uh, what, so we've been tracking human movement using, not we, the state has been trapping, trapping, tracking, excuse me, human movement using uh, relative cell phone movement. There was a spike in movement. There was a spike in gatherings. If you look on Facebook, there were so many people I just wanted to beat with a wet noodle because they, they, they it, the issue is a little bit in Louisiana. A small family gathering usually involves 45 people. So mm -hmm. Similarly I, here. Yeah, so I expect in the next couple of days we're going to start seeing an uptrend and a spike. Um, as far as how much, where we're going to get to, again, people are going to get impatient and they're going to, they're going to want to go see people. I mean, people are going to want to get back to work, which is completely understandable. So it's such a complicated, biologically, the best thing to do, everybody stay home. But this is not a biological problem in isolation. It's a, socio, a sociological problem. It's a psychological problem. It's an economics, economical problem. So, so I don't think I, as an expert in none of those things, can mm -hmm. tell you what I think is going to happen. Okay. Oh, well, what about this one about what we would need for establishing herd immunity? Um, yeah. So the estimate I see it is seventy percent. Wait. It says, is it true that's oh until seventy percent? So I think yes, fifty would be a minimum, but I think seventy would be better. Um, but again, it just depends on the. <clears throat> if you say seventy percent of the population. It's sort of like, what's the scale? 
is it your city is it the state is it us is it the global oh. and then it's going to depend on the movement between those scales and so mm -hmm. in a small patch right 50 to 70 percent might be fine if you're talking about a city or a state 70 is going to be better okay so chris asked a follow-up about long-term immunity after infection what do we see in other coronaviruses can we draw information from that so it's my understanding that in other respiratory infections like coronaviruses or rsv IgA re IgG responses, which is what you usually look for in bloodborne pathogens, which is what I usually study, is not necessarily long-term protective. I don't know if that's the case with the other SARS or MERS or, um, or with this. That needs to be done. I think before we start telling people that it's protective and we start putting, for example, healthcare workers back to work after infection saying, oh, you've got IgG, and they go back and they're like, I'm Superman, mm -hmm. and then they get it again. Um, we need to do studies to determine if IgG is long-term. In fact, it is long-term, or if there's waning, because if there's if it's protective but there's waning, then you just need a booster strategy for a vaccine, and that's that's doable. But if you need to target IgA as the protective, because that's the respiratory tract uh, major antibody, that's going to require something a little different. Okay. We had a question about mutation rate. Does that affect testing consensus sequences? So how does a high mutation rate have an effect? So this actually doesn't have that high mutation rate. So if you go to nextstrain.org, it looks like there's a high mutation rate, but the, the most of those mutations are kind of like, not nonsense, but they're not, they're not leading, there, there's no five viruses out there. There's maybe two lineages that pathogenically, they seem to be very similar. Um, the parts of the genome on the envelope and the spike seem to be relatively conserved. Um, and this actually, the RDRP, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of coronaviruses is not as error-prone, my understanding, as the flu, which sucks. And that's why you get so much mutation in flu is because the RDRP is kind of wobbly. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> yeah. So it's not, not as bad as some. It's not as bad as some, right. Okay. Well, did you have any uh, last thoughts you wanted to impart? And we can let you wrap up and get back to work. Don't be impatient. Stay home for as long as it takes. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. And I know everyone joins me in thanking you for all of your time and everything you're doing for the people of your state. Great. Thanks. Thanks right, for having and, me, y'all. And we look forward to having you actually on campus, hopefully, <laughs> once things settle down. Great. VTech took me to a taco place many years ago. I want to go back. <laughs> and there will be others, I'm sure, once they all re reopen. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Dr. Christofferson, for your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.